Okay, hello, hello, hello. Sorry, I've seen that person there just jump out of the skin. I'm <laughs> sorry about that. So I thought I'd start this session. We're um, at quarter past, so. Um, this session is about PowerShell with AWS Lambda and serverless computing. Um, I'm Martin Beebe. I'm a principal evangelist at AWS. Um, I was here Monday doing a, uh, Tuesday, sorry, doing a talk. And um, for those that were here, they would have known that I do a thing called an Inception slide, which is my picture of me in front of a slide. And Kenny's going to take a picture of me. Thank you very much. Um, because this is me in front of a slide, 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 17 layers deep um, so far, a, a continuous chain of 17 layers. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to get it up to 100. By the end of the year, we'll see. Um, so I've been a software developer since I was 16 years old, um, and I've been developing now for actually 21 years. It was my birthday this week. Um, I've worked at uh, Microsoft as a, an evangelist and an SDE. I uh, worked at Oracle as uh, an evangelist and director of evangelism. And now I joined Amazon uh, Web Services about, a, about eight months ago um, as an evangelist, fo principally focusing on .NET. And so um, I'm a .NET developer, really, although I do a lot of other languages as well. I'm very polyglot in that sense. I'd like, um, I do an awful lot of um, Go and Node. So one of the reasons that I really like serverless, and I've been using serverless so much in, in the sort of applications that I've been building over the last uh, three, or so, three or four years, is that you can kind of mix and match and choose any language, really. Um, specifically on Lambda and AWS, um, you, there we have a number of supported languages which you, ha which you can use in, in, in AWS, and most of the major ones, PowerShell being one of the supported languages. Um, but there's also you know, a thing called custom runtime. So you can actually run literally any language um, you want inside of, inside of Lambda. And what I find I do in serverless applications is I often pick the best language for the particular task. You end up chaining together um, serverless uh, microservices together uh, in, in sort of unison to produce some kind of orchestration. And sometimes, most of the time, I'll choose to use C-sharp for most of my parts, um, but very often I'll drop into Python if I'm having to do some kind of image or audio manipulation. Um, and more recently, I've been experimenting with PowerShell. Um, there are other people on the team which are kind of more familiar with PowerShell, worked a lot more in, in PowerShell. PowerShell for me has always been kind of like a side thing. I, I use it a lot in stuff, but I've never been really very, very deep in it. Um, Andrew Pierce was going to come here and give this talk, um, but he, he, uh, he was having some problems uh, with, with getting over and, and travel and stuff like that. So I, I jumped in and said that I'd do it. And um, during that period, I've kind of been looking into PowerShell and serverless. So I've got quite a lot of experience with serverless, but I've learned an awful lot in the last uh, month or so about PowerShell and the support which we have there. And over the next uh, hour or so, I'll be sharing that with you. And hopefully by the end of this session, you'll understand a little bit more about AWS Lambda, a little bit more about serverless, and obviously a lot more about how PowerShell works on Lambda. So um, let me just say, well, what is Lambda? Oops, here is. Let me just... Uh... Lambda is AWS's serverless platform. It was one of the first serverless platforms. And um, there was a company called iron.io, which um, I, I worked for for a, a brief period of time, which had a, a, a service which did predate Lambda. But the first production kind of large-scale serverless platform was Lambda. And I actually remember when it was launched thinking, that will never catch on. You know, it's kind of a... It was a silly, it just, I was working at Microsoft at the time and, and I was watching reInvent coming through and I, I saw this Lambda thing and I was like, I just don't understand that. Why would you want to do that? Why would you want to create those sort of things? No one ever heard of, uh, you know, you can, you can write these things in a, in a container. It would be much easier to do it in, in Docker or something like that. And I, I never really understood why people were interested in Lambda. But then my history on predicting te technical trends has never been great. I said the iPad would never take off. I was pretty sure that Windows Phone was going to be a huge hit. And uh, I know I didn't have an iPhone until last year. So, you know, I'm not great always at picking these, these things. And what I've learned, sorry. Amazon phones? Uh, well, yeah, I've, I've missed that boat, I'm afraid. But I'm, so, I'm the sort of person which still would stick in and say the Amazon Fire Phone would, you know, it, it might have a revival. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it was kind of interesting, this, this kind of idea of, 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 of Lambda. And immediately, I didn't, I didn't really understand some of the benefits. I think that that was the problem with my approach to it. I just saw it as like a gimmick and didn't really realize. Now, that happened in 2015 or 14 when it was launched. 
Now, most of the conversations I have with customers are about serverless. Um, most of the interest in, in, in new people to, to, to AWS or the things that they want to do with their applications involve serverless in some way. Um, it's a huge part of, of, of what we do with customers nowadays. And um, uh, people are re-architecting their applications and saving a lot of money by doing that as well. We've got examples of customers which are saving uh, one a charity in the UK called Comic Relief who saved 93% of their hosting costs by moving to serverless. So 93%, to give context, they spend about $85,000 a month and they moved their hosting cost to $5,000 a month just by moving and changing their architecture to serverless. And they also have the benefit of higher resiliency, uh, better performance. Um, so in the kind of application development world, I'm all for serverless. And I understand that when it comes to PowerShell, it's not always the application you know, it's not always necessarily application development, but there are lots of use cases where it's really, really powerful and really good to, or an interesting sort of idea to use um, for all sorts of applications. And we'll look, we'll look at some of those today. So the basic premise is you take a piece of code, you package that piece of code up, and you give it to AWS, and AWS will run it. When that piece of code's invoked, it will just magically invoke and return a response. Um, but you don't have to worry about any of the servers underlying it. You don't have to think about the infrastructure, the network, how that all actually executes, how it power, like power, the parallel execution or how uh, things are invocated, how things are scaled or scaled down. None of it's of interest or should be of interest to the developer. What the developer cares about is the piece of code that they're working on. It will scale um, automatically and it will scale, you know, to, to a very large sort of, um, uh, to support very large applications, and some of the world's large applications are using serverless. Um, so it, it's been battle tested over the since 2015 when it was launched. Um, and it was scale automatically, and you don't, as a developer, have to really worry about how it scales or what, what it's doing under the hood. You can find out more if you want, but fundamentally, it's just a case of taking your code and and, and having it execute. Um, most of these uh, most of these Lambda functions um, are executed either directly through an API call or in response to an event. In fact, an API call is an event, so you know it's all events. It's an event-driven sort of uh, paradigm. So your piece of code gets an event, it does some execution, and then it stops working. And you're only paying for the point which is actually executing uh, the computation, which again is really interesting because if, you, if you're building an application or an API, um, you're only going to be paying for it if it's being used. So it kind of has a, you know, it mirrors your actual customer usage of your application. So no longer do you have to have a fleet of servers sitting there in, in, just in case. You can actually just put your code out there and um, build applications, and you're not paying for that idle. You know, when, when the application's not being used or, or not being run, you're not paying for it. So what about PowerShell in, in AWS Lambda? So PowerShell um, core language support was launched uh, last year uh, in September. And um, under the hood, it uses uh, the .NET Core 2.1 runtime. So it sits on top of that. If you build, when you build a PowerShell Lambda, if you look at the sort of output from the build, you'll see .NET stuff happening. You'll see DLLs being created. You'll see a C project being uh created. However, the developer experience is very much you're in PowerShell. The build experience does heavily rely on the, uh, the .NET uh, core runtime underneath it. And the um, module which kind of powers the uh, Lambda PowerShell experience is AWS Lambda PS Core. And that's what contains um, blueprints, and we'll be looking at some of those blueprints, which are basically like templates for serverless Lambdas, uh, for Lambdas. Um, and it, one of the cool things, it's, it's, it's open source. So if you go to github.com, AWS, uh, forward slash, AWS Lambda dot net, there's a file in there called, a folder in there called PowerShell, um, where the, the module is, is, is open source and you can look at it and see how we fit it together and how it fits together in the grander scheme of things. The important thing is that you don't actually have to do any of that. The, the, the importance of serverless and the thing which is really powerful about service is to try and forget about the underlying infrastructure and just know that AWS are constantly working on improving it. So um, the speeds, the cool thing which I've, I've noted over the, over the, over the times, every time um, AWS under the covers 
re-architects or changes the way the actual container orchestration is working under the hood, you get performance benefits in your lambdas free of charge. So year on year, your APIs just get better and better and better as AWS improves the platform that it runs on. Um, so when you've got a, uh, a PowerShell script, which is going to be um, uh, which is going to be your Lambda, that's going to be the, the, the code of your Lambda, you're going to be executed, an event's going to happen, and you're going to get two um, objects come into your script. One is going to be uh, Lambda input, which is a PS object containing the input data from the event. So if that's an API call, it'll be you know, the, the information about what was sent on the API call. If, it was, if, it's a, if it's a string or a piece of JSON, it'll come in as a string or a piece of JSON inside of that, um, in that, that Lambda input object. And you can inspect that object, and you can read the values of it, and then that's usually what drives your function. And you also get a thing called a Lambda context. And the Lambda context is more about how the event was created. And the Lambda context will change depending, dramatically potentially, depending on what invoked the Lambda function. Because we can invoke the Lambda function with lots of things nowadays. It's not just an API call or someone calling it from a console or, or the SDK or something like that. You can call it from an, an IoT button, from a CloudWatch event, all sorts of things. So the context will give you an intro, will understand where the event came from and how it, how it landed upon inside of your, your source code. Um, yeah, so. When you're, uh, when you're working with, with Lambda um, in PowerShell, you're going to have uh, write host, write verbose, write information, write warning, and write error. If you call any of those, uh, those commandlets uh, inside the script, it's going to log whatever you've written there. So if you, if you call uh, write host with uh, some information, that will automatically get logged into CloudWatch for you. Um, you don't have to set anything specifically up for that. Just by enabling or creating a, a, a Lambda and calling uh, uh, write host, we sort of proxy that under the hood into the log files. So the basic Lambda function that you create, um, one of the blueprints that's created, will have that write host uh, feature in there. Uh, and that's all it will do. It will take an event in, and it will just echo it uh, to the log by using uh, write host. Um, Obviously, you've got some inputs. They're the JSON objects. They come in as PS objects. Um, you can inspect those things. You can do different things with it. But then you're going to output some, some context. And the last thing, which is in the, uh, the PowerShell pipeline, is what's going to be emitted to the function. Um, if it's a string, it will be returned as such. If it's a, uh, any other kind of object, it will be converted to JSON. And that's what will be responded back to the, uh, to the, to the source. Um, in most cases, you can just literally you know, have an object and just return it, and that will work fine, and you can call that and, and stuff. But if you've got a, maybe an API gateway in front of it, you might want to respond back with HTML or with, with um, sorry, a HTTP response and things, and you can, custom, you can build those sort of uh, things. And I'll show you a little bit about how that works as well. But it's quite easy to just output you know, the, last, the last object, and uh, that will be, be the thing which gets sent back um, So let's say if we've just started a brand new uh, PowerShell script. And uh, the first thing we might want to do if we're trying to create a project from scratch is we're going to import the AWS Lambda PS core uh, commandlet, uh, module. Sorry. And there are a number of things inside this module, a uh, number of commands that you've got. The four, the, the four ones are uh, get AWS PowerShell Lambda template, which is going to get you uh, the, the templates, uh, new AWS PowerShell Lambda, so I'm obviously going to create a, a new Lambda uh, for you. Uh, a new AWS PowerShell Lambda package, which is the way that we would package up um, a file into a zip file effectively, which is what the payload, which, which Lambda accepts. Or publish uh, AWS PowerShell Lambda, which is uh, the mechanism by which we can publish a, um, a package directly to the, uh, the, the, uh, the service. So if we uh, just call get... AWS PowerShell temp, uh, Lambda template, it will return all of the blueprints which are in the module. And these are kind of like get started templates. And regardless of the language that you're using, most of all the supported languages, I think, use, have the exact same kind of uh, templates. So if you come from, if you've ever done Node Lambda or C Sharp Lambda, 
you will find that they all have an S3 event uh, template. They all have a detect labels, a code commit trigger template to show you how you take one of those events and how you would build an app, uh, sort of build a script and then respond to it. And they're kind of like simple getting started um, things. Um, obviously, this is all open source, so if you have a great template or an, uh, an example script, you know, please do think about contributing that back to the community because um, these things are really, I find them the, the, the kind of a 101 getting started, and uh, the better they are, the, the better the 101 experience uh, for Lambda will be. So if we want to use a blueprint or a template in our application, um, we'd run in PowerShell, uh, we'll give a uh, variable or function name, uh, demo basics. And then we say new uh, AWS PowerShell Lambda. Um, and we then uh, choose the basic template and give the name or the script a name. And what's this going to do? It's going to just create a PowerShell script with that template. Um, it's going to create a folder with uh, a script in, in that folder. So um, this is what the script, there's some comments in the file which it creates. I've removed those. Um, but this is the important thing about the base, basic skeleton for a Lambda function in PowerShell. The top thing is an example of us importing a, a module. And um, many people are going to be wanting to import uh, modules and third-party modules. This is us, an example of us importing the, uh, the, the NetCore uh, module so that we can actually interact with AWS services if we, were, if we wanted to. Um, we don't require that line. If we're not going to actually in integrate with AWS services, then just remove that. Um, and then the, the line three, uh, write host, what that's doing is it's just um, converting or taking the Lambda input, the input object, and it's just writing that to the log. So this function does nothing more than echo whatever came into it as a parameter back to the log. Once you've built that folder and you've got your file structure, you can then use the publish-aws PowerShell Lambda commandlet to take um, that, that file and construct the actual execute the zip file, which is the sort of payload which the service accepts. And um, it doesn't matter what language you do this in, you always end up with a zip file which contains your, uh, your, your application, I guess, and the, and the manifest file which describes what's in, in involved in it, what runtimes and so forth are running. And um, when you run this, this is going to do a .NET Core build. Um, under the hood, it's using .NET Core. These are all running on Linux. Um, so it's, uh, it will build that thing, it will, it will create it into a zip file. That zip file could then literally be taken to the console on the website and uploaded. Or if you're using this function, it's going to take that zip file and, and magically just post it to your, your account. Obviously, all of this is based upon the idea that you're, you're, you're actually logged in to your AWS account on, on, in PowerShell. So you would have to obviously uh, be in there and you're in the right profile. And then if you just published AWS PowerShell Lambda, it will look for global variables about what region you're currently in and what your account is, and then it will publish it to your account for you. Um, you don't have to publish directly. Um, you, that's quite handy for you know, getting started. But if you've got like a, a build process where you want to just package something up, um, then you would use the other command bit, which is AWS uh, PowerShell Lambda package, new AWS PowerShell Lambda package. And all that does is, is it does part of the build, right? It builds the whole thing, it puts it in the zip file, and then it's finished. It doesn't actually then go and um, put it anywhere. So what I do in most of my examples is I will do this kind of build, and then I will take that zip file, I will upload it to S3, and then I will do a publish with it in S3. Um, that's the, the mechanism I use, but you could easily publish it to a zip file like this, and then you could put it on a USB key, you could walk around, plug it into another computer and upload it. You could do whatever you want. It's a zip file which you can, you can uh, th this, 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 all of the, uh, all of Lambda just deals with is, is your applications or your Lambda functions in these zip file payloads. Once you've um, uploaded it, maybe you've published it and zipped it and, and put it on the website, or maybe you've just used the, the direct publish from, from, from PowerShell, then you can, you can invoke it. And so uh, we, we have a, uh, uh, a commandlet in the AWS tool, uh, uh, SDK, which we say invoke uh, func the own function. So we just pass the function name to that uh, invoke LM function, and we will get a response back. Now, you'll notice that my actual um, first boilerplate application, if I did this, I would get an error because it doesn't actually come back with anything. So I'll try and do conversions and stuff like that, and there's no actual response from it. But 
I would say most people aren't actually going to ever really do this in production. This is just a nice way of executing a function, probably. Most people are going to be executing functions based upon events that happen in their architecture. Um, there's also another way that you can do it, which is through the console. We can, we can invoke a function directly from the Lambda console. So um, if we're in the, the Lambda function, we go into the functions. So I have eight functions on my machine at the moment, on this thing at the moment. I go into this demo basics uh, Lambda function. And you'll see there's no triggers. Um, all I want to do is, is do a trigger test. So I create a, uh, a test payload. I have to give the payload a name. So I'll call this um, hello payload. And it's just a JSON string with three key values. And I'll just send that over. And it will execute my function. That's the very first execution of my function. So it will be a bit slower um, as it's a cold start. Um, and then subsequent executions will be far faster. If I look at the, the logs in, in CloudWatch, my function doesn't return anything, but it does write to the logs. So if I look at the logs, you'll see there's, there we are. We've, we've logged the information, key value, key value, key value. Um, so that's the, the boilerplate Lambda function for PowerShell. That's all it does. It doesn't actually do a response. OK. So it just writes to the logs. Write host, convert JSON, uh, convert to JSON, and takes the whatever's been passed to the, to the function and, and logs it. Not particularly useful. Um, you can also not just have a script. You can also invoke a function, a PowerShell function. Um, so it's the same sort of deal. We'll just create a, um, um, a, PS, a PS1 file, like just a, a, a simple file in, in, in code. Um, and then this is a PowerShell function called invoke me. There's two params which get passed in, input and uh, the context ones. I'm going to write host and do exactly what we did in the last function, just pass the, the whatever's been passed on in the input. I can write verbose, which works. Write information. I can write warning. Um, I can also write error, but be warned if you do write error, then that will also signify that the Lambda has failed um, because you're writing errors. So, And then... Um, if there, is an, if there is something which is in the JSON which looks like a name, then I'll um, output that. Else, I'll output hello world. So we can save that function. So. Yep. Yep. As soon as it hits that, the first one will all error occur. Sorry. So you were saying the, when the first when the first error occurs, is that terminate the function? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, um, so that, uh, that function, uh, demo function one, um, what we're going to do is I'm going to go into IAM and get a role for this function. Uh, an IAM role is in, in AWS gives it the, the access, the access it needs to, to, uh, to run, uh, and to call other services. And the only thing I've changed here is I've got this invoke me PowerShell function handler. And I'm going to use the, uh, the published AWS PowerShell Lambda commandlet. Um, it's going to, I've specified this invoke me function. I'm going to publish that now. And then that will then be published up to Lambda. Um, but rather than just running the script, it will look inside the uh, PowerShell and find that function and invoke that function and pass it in that way. So you can invoke functions that way. You can also invoke, um, you can also uh, have a module and invoke that directly as well. Um, so, Uh, we can invoke that directly from um, from uh, from PowerShell, as we saw earlier. But mostly, um, I'll show how you would make you invo invoke that one from the from the console. So. Go into the Lambda console. We have a dashboard which shows you all of the kind of um, I don't know, information about how your invocations are running and what's running and um, how many invocations you've had and how long they're lasting and, and all that sort of stuff. Look at demo functions. Because I added that IAM role on the right-hand side there, it's got different IAM roles that it can be used. It can it can use. 
I'm going to just add in a, uh, uh, I'm just going to pass in with, with this constructed um, JSON file, which says name and console. So it's calling from console, payload. And because that name uh, element exists, it's going to return back um, hello console. And if the name element didn't exist, it would return back, obviously, hello world. It's quite a nice feature inside of the, the thing to be able to just test these um, directly. Um, all of our SDKs support um, executing these lambdas um, in different kind of nice ways. Um, you get a log output directly from it as well, so we can see what, the, what was logged. Um, so we'll see that you know when I verbose logged or done the information log or the warning log. Um, and it also shows me how much memory was used in the execution of that lambda as well. And also things like how long the duration was and how much I was billed for that lambda as well. Uh, the minimum bill is 100 milliseconds. So it's, um, there you go. I, actually, the duration of the lambda is 41.39 milliseconds, but I was billed for 100 milliseconds of execution. Um, so it's per 100 millisecond execution. Um, So if I just pass in a, in a, in a, J, J, a JSON payload which doesn't have that name property in it, it's obviously going to do a switch and it's going to return uh, hello world now because um, it doesn't contain that name member in there. I dig, dug into the, the J, JSON and, and, and did the same thing. And so I've, I've logged again you know, what came in um, and then the verbose logging and all that stuff happened. And you'll see that um, the duration of that one was 83.49. That was six milliseconds, that was five milliseconds, six milliseconds. Um, the execution will vary depending on, depending on a number of different factors, um, but you can monitor all of that stuff and find out how long your functions are executing for. Um, if you do call out to certain, certain services, you may find that there are penalties or, or things. So, for example, if you call out to RDS, that's an, one of the services at the moment, which there is a bit of networking stuff which happens, which causes lambdas to be a bit slower on the first invocation. Um, they're working on, 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 on the architecture of that, and, and hopefully some of those problems will be ironed out. Um, but there will be cases if you're calling a service and, and all of a sudden you're adding, you know, you get a very long cold start, it may be one of the services which are, are causing sort of those sorts of issues. So what did we learn there? We, we sort of seen how you develop a PowerScript, uh, PowerShell Lambda. Um, you can do it um, using functions, modules, or just plain old scripts. You can... Um, you can actually build them and publish them from, from, from command line, or you can, um, you can build them into zip files and you can make that part of your CI CD pipelines and, and workflows and, and, and however you want to do it in your build process. Um, so you can do direct publishing with PowerShell or zip file packaging. And it's just fundamentally, you're just working in PowerShell. So everything which works in PowerShell and at core will work, work here. And, um, as long as you understand that there's certain things, there's certain objects coming in, and the way that you pass objects back out, then you're able to build um, lambdas just like you do in any other language. So let's talk about event-driven computing and serverless a little bit more. So it's becoming like I think it's the 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 the, the, the sort of pinnacle of of, of cloud architecture in, in some ways. Is this is exactly what I want at least as a developer. I don't want to deal with networking and computers. I don't want to have to deal with servers anymore. Um, I don't even really want to deal with Kubernetes. I don't really want to deal with container and orchestrators. I actually just want to develop code and have it run and know that it's going to be scalable. Um, and AWS are really good at running this kind of um, large scale operational sort of work. I am not good at running large-scale operational work. And so it's a good way of being able to, you know, I can focus on the skills that I have as a developer and kind of not, uh, and pass all the operational side of things um, onto, onto AWS to some, to some respect, to, in some ways. Um, but it also, it just frees me up to be more impactful. I can actually focus on the things that I need to do and be more impactful on the little niche things that I need to be good at and not worry about so much of the stuff which is, you know, I don't, I'm not good at. I'm never going to be an expert necessarily. And, um, it's really scalable, and it's it's flexibly uh, it's flexible in that um, you can use any language you want. It can scale um, pretty much infinitely. To, to with, there are some rate limits and certain things on on certain accounts, but it, um, it is is it is very scalable, um, highly available. You know, the Lambda service is 
you know, we don't, you don't even have to worry about this, but it's highly available. It runs across our availability zones. So it's not just running in one availability zone in AWS. Every region in AWS has um, a minimum of three availability zones. Each availability zone is made up of one or more data centers. And the Lambda service runs across all of those availability zones. So you can be guaranteed that if one of our availability zones fails, if we have a natural disaster in one of those availability zones, if, it's, if there's an earthquake or, or whatnot, Lambda will just keep running in that region because it will just fail over to the other availability zones. And you don't have to worry about that. Lambda worries about that, and that service provider worries about that. Um, so it's very resilient. Um, most people aren't build, building multi-availability uh, zone applications, um, and it's quite cool that you can get all really for free. Um, and when I say free, there, there's... there's um, if you want to try any of this stuff out, you get a million on the free tier, or AWS free tier, you get a million invocations of Lambda a month um, free. And so if you want to try this out and you want to try it out at some scale, you can do. Um, so, uh, you know, it's, uh, it, it's, it's quite cool to, to sort of be able to pick this stuff up and just start using it without any cost. So code is triggered in response to an event. And it's obviously sometimes a direct invocation through an API. It's often service events, and it's more commonly service events. So things happening in infrastructure, things being added into queues, queues eventing other things. And um, when I started in serverless, most people just showed a really simple API, which you would call, and then some work would happen. Now most of the customers that I am speaking to have very highly orchestrated uh, serverless applications. Um, their microservices you know, are able to scale independently. They only pay for the portions of the applications that they use. And um, you know, they have very complicated uh, workflows which orchestrate those different those functions to work as one to create full applications. Um, there's a blueprint, for example, in the C-sharp um, C world uh, for an ASP.NET application. So you can actually have an ASP.NET website running in Lambda. So it, it's an ASP.NET core proper sample uh, which you have running in, 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 in a Lambda. So you don't just have to host a single API. You can actually orchestrate these applications or create these applications um, so they can run much more complicated applications than just simply returning a microservice. Um, it creates loo loosely coupled systems. We can, you often, because it's event-driven and we're, it's very easy to start using queues, um, you can find that you're able to create Microservices um, which are, can independently scale and are decoupled, and the sort of the way that your messages are being passed on, or maybe a queue or something like that, to uh, to uncouple these systems. It's working asynchronously, um, automatically scale, and again, you don't pay for this, this this idle stuff. So I thought I'd try and show you a, a little bit more of a complicated demo. Maybe the meaning of life, the universe, and everything. I wanted to start with a really problematic uh, uh, thing. How do, we, how do we solve the meaning of life, the universe, and everything? Um, well, if any of you are Hitchhikers fans, you'll know that the almighty answer to the meaning of life, the universe, and everything was calculated by the computer Deep Thought for 7 million years, and the answer was 42. So I'm going to basically re-implement Deep Thought in Lambda. Um, now, you're all under NDA here. Uh, so... What I'm about to show you, I think, might change my career for the better. It's, it's some of the most complicated code I've ever written. So please um, don't share any of this uh, with anyone. So this is the PowerShell um, code that I wrote for this. So um, I take a JSON object in. I log that unnecessarily. And then I take a, uh, I basically put an object with a value 42, and then I return that 42. So this function does what you expect it to do. It basically always, regardless of what comes into it, it will always return 42. Thank you, thank you. Thanks very much. Um, so, for example, if we put this uh, application up there and then I put in uh, uh, an event payload, what is the meaning of life? Just pass a string in it. Actually, it doesn't matter if I pass a string because it completely ignores it, but I could pass JSON in if I wanted, whatever. And then I test that. That function returns 42. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Cheers. I was hoping that would get some kind of level of applause. Um, and, you know, if we execute it again, it always returns 42. 
And you can see that we've logged the what's the meaning of life in the uh, in information in the logs, and it's telling you uh, use a maximum memory of 124 megabytes. It's, it's obviously like there's a lot of stuff happening in that function just beyond me returning 42 clearly. But um, uh, that just goes to show you, you know, it's it's very simple to write something which just responds, and that's the simplest way you do it in PowerShell. Now, if we wanted to actually create an API of that, we'd have to do a little bit more work. We have to change the PS object which gets returned to look a little bit more um, like something that API Gateway can handle. Um, so I took the same function fundamentally, and I just packaged it up with an object at the bottom um, with a status code of 200, um, the body object being answer, and um, header as text plain. So this is kind of now, I want to convert this into an, an API of sorts, which is going to be uh, hosted on the web. Um, so to do that, what I need to do is create an event which is someone coming to my website, coming to my URL. And we have a service in, in, in AWS called API Gateway, which is extremely powerful. Um, API Gateway often fronts these Lambda applications. You can use it to do all sorts of things about proxying and changing uh, and moving, calling different functions, and have one single domain name, basically, with different routes, which call lots of different functions and so forth. Um, and um, you can change the inputs, you can change the headers and the outputs and all sorts of things. It's a very, very powerful um, sort of proxy or gateway uh, for your APIs. And so what I'm going to do is just attach it to that function. So I'll go into that function in the Lambda console, and I'm going to add an API gateway. So to add an API gateway, I go to the triggers, and I choose gateway. And then I say I want a new API. So I could choose one which I already have, or I can create a new one. I'll create a new one. I say, well, do I want security? No, I don't want to use any security. I'll just leave it open because uh, everyone should uh, have, have access to this, this amazing technology. We'll save it, and then that's created an API gateway for me. If I went to the API gateway console, I would see it there, and then you'll see now I have a URL, which if I go to that URL, it returns 42 um, pretty reliably as well. It's uh, some of the most uh, error-free code that I've ever written. Um, so if you do want to share that with friends or whatever, then you know you are more welcome. But just don't share the code. Um, so that was uh, that was an event, an API event, an API gateway event. But there's lots of other events that you can use. Um, one might be uh, uh, a really common one you'll see in every demo is the uh, S3 bucket. So an S3 bucket is a, is a simple storage service in AWS, and if anything is added to a bucket, that can fire an event. And in the event, it will pass the information about what was uploaded to the bucket. You can inspect that inside of the, uh, inside of the function, and you can do stuff with it. Um, so we can, um, it, it, it's very, uh, an S3 bucket, in this instance, is almost acting like a queue. I can put stuff in, I could put messages in it, like files or logs, or I could put in images or whatever and deal with that. We have better services for queues, like SQS or, uh, or other things, but this would work. You'd have a, a bucket which triggers an event when, it, when, it ha when something gets put into it, and then that calls a Lambda function. Um, you can also have, um, you know, uh, let's just say we want to use a bucket again um, for our messages. We could have um, the bucket which triggers an SNS topic, and then we can have different Lambdas which are listening to different topics. So this is like a, a sub-pub subscription. Um, so we have different, different functions which do different things, listening for different types of things that are being put into that bucket. And then SNS will direct the messages or the, the items to the correct functions. Um, we might then um, uh, fan that out again with um, putting that in, instead of directly delivering it to the, uh, to the lambdas, we could put it into a queue and have many lambdas listening to the queue. So if we had a million items put into the SQS queue, we could theoretically have a million lambdas just instant, instantly like parallel um, working on that queue and, and pulling different things out of the queue. Um, the cool thing about working with queues in Lambda is that you don't have to do anything to pull something from the queue. You just create an SQS queue, and the service team in SQS has done all the clever work. You just get evented in your Lambda. You're, it just comes in as an event. Something's been added to the queue. Here it is. And you can process that queue. We have ways of putting it back in the queue or putting it in a dead letter queue to say that it didn't work or there was a problem with that particular message or that image or whatnot. Um, so it's very easy to write very kind of dumb Lambda functions but create very complicated kind of architectures where messages are getting passed around, where we're dealing with different um, types of messages with different functions. We're using queues to, to create uh, high scalability and, 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 and parallel uh, execution. 
Um, so let's just look at the basic example, though, an S3 event trigger. So I want something which gets put into a bucket to trigger my, my event. So um, there's a new Lambda, uh, there's a function, there's a way of creating um, a, a new Lambda um, from a template. We've already done that with the basic template. But there's one called detect labels. It's in every language, and it's also in the PowerShell language. They've implemented detect labels there as well. And what detect labels does is it calls our recognition service. Recognition service is a, a computer vision AI service. You give it an image or a video, and it will tell you what's in that image or video. And it, will, it can do lots of things. It can do celebrity recognition. It can do... Um, but what we're going to use it for is label detection. And what it'll do is take any image and it will, lab take, it will label everything it sees in it. So bottle of Coke, laptop, people, audience, auditorium, those sorts of things. It's a simple API. You call it with an image payload or a video payload, and it responds with a JSON response. We can call that from within PowerShell. So what we're going to do is upload an image into an S3 bucket. That's going to call recognition. We're going to find the labels in that image, and we're going to then get those labels, and we're going to put it back on the S3 object as metadata. So in that, my S3 bucket now, I'm going to have some labels on that which describe what's in that image. Could be useful uh, for lots of things, but certainly useful for a demo. So um, this is, um, uh, again, just doing demo labels uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a demo. I'm just going to use the, the, the PS Core module. I'm going to reach over to um, the IAM roles to get a, an IAM role to, to, for the execution of this function. I'm going to create a new function from the blueprint using new AWS PowerShell Lambda. I'm going to use the template direct labels. And then um, that's going to create a, uh, a folder. And in that folder, it's just got this, this PowerShell fi file. Um, it's a little bit more advanced than the one we've seen previously. It's got a requires module. It, it includes this module because it's going to interact with AWS service recognition. It does some work to basically say, I only want to really work on JPEGs, uh, PNGs, or GIFs. Um, and for each, you'll see the input lambda comes through. For each um, uh, input lambda or object, it's going to try and see if that uh, is a of type an image if it contains, it's got an extension, which is an image extension. It's then going to say, um, or find a, an environment variable about confidence. So it needs to be above 70% confident about to use the label. Um, I'm writing host all the time, just doing logs. Then I call find-rec-label, uh, which is calling the recognition service with the AWS um, SDK. And I'm just basically returning the first 10 labels that come back from recognition. Um, I found, I print the number of labels that I found. Um, I'll post up to 10, so it could be 9, it could be 8, um, up to 10. And then for each uh, object, what I do is I create a tag, an S3 tag, which I'm going to add back onto the S3 object. So write S3 object tag set. We pass back the tag to that particular object in S3. It's quite a straightforward, um, it is quite a straightforward like, piece, of, piece of code. Um, what we'll do then is, uh, this is um, packaging up that zip file. So I'm going to package up the zip file. And then write that, uh, write that, that package over to a bucket. So you'll see it's doing its build in .NET. So I'm going to upload that uh, and publish it. So once it's done the build and I've got my package, I'm going to just write that to a, an S3 thing, which I, I keep all of my Lambda packages, my zip files, my Lambda packages in. And then once that's uploaded to S3, I can then do a publish. But instead of publishing directly from my machine, I'm publishing it by passing in um, a reference to that S3, uh, that S3 um, object. So now it's going to publish my Lambda function, but I'm kind of using an S3 bucket as an intermediary to store my, uh, my code. Again, you wouldn't be doing this probably. This would be part of a build server. But that's now my function is uh, built. It's uploaded. It's now an API uh, which is sitting in the, in the cloud. Um, I'm going to add an upload bucket, which is going to be the thing which I'm going to store my images in. 
So this is going to create a new S3 bucket. It's called a trigger bucket. So it's demo PS con EU event PowerShell bucket with a GUID on the end of it. I'm then going to add a permission for that bucket to be able to invoke lambdas. I'm doing this all in PowerShell. You wouldn't necessarily do it in PowerShell. You could all do this in console if you wished. And then finally, um, what I'm going to do is add a, um, an S3 notification uh, trigger to, to, that, uh, to that bucket. So any, when anything's added to that bucket, this is, what, this is actually what causes or, or events or triggers. So we're just adding a trigger to that S3 bucket to call my Lambda. Um, you could alternatively add the trigger from the console, and this is probably more visual and more e easy to understand. So in the demo labels um, function, what you can go to is add S3, a bit like well, how we did with API Gateway. We then just configure it. We basically select the bucket that we want to, uh, to use. So demo psconf, that one. And we say any object create event, so any object which is added to this bucket is going to fire or trigger this event. We're going to add that. Save that. And now anything which I add to that S3 bucket is going to call my uh, Lambda function. So now I can upload this file. This JPEG called Snova. I'm going to upload that. And now it will upload that to S3, that image. And now if I go to the, the metadata of that image, the properties of that image uh, up here, there's a tags property of all images. You'll see there's nine tags now added to that image. And you see there's a human. It's 90%, 99% sure he's a human. Accessories, tie, 99% sure he's a tie. Accessories, there's an audience, there's a necktie, crowd, speech, and person. It's recognized all of that in that image. And this is the image which I uploaded there. And no wonder it recognized that tie. So, um, so yeah, I've shown API Gateway executing an event. I've shown S3 executing an event. But they were the kind of the beginnings of, of, of Lambda. Now, pretty much any event that happens in your infrastructure can invoke a, uh, a Lambda. So any kind of event, really. Um, there's some which are more obvious than others. Um, if you go onto Amazon.com and buy 20 pounds, you can get a thing called an AWS IoT button. That IoT button has a serial number on the back. You can add an IoT button to your Lambda trigger. It will ask you for the serial number on the back of the thing that you bought from Amazon. You put the serial number in, and then every time that's then connected, every time you press that uh, button, it will invoke your function. So um, I know we have like the buttons which are f for voting on sessions here. You could easily implement that with one of these Amazon uh, IoT buttons, AWS uh, IoT buttons. Um, DynamoDB is a database, a NoSQL database. Any item which is added to that database can invoke a Lambda function. Um, simple notification service, Cognito, if people log on, if fail to log on, uh, authenticate, don't authenticate. Um, CloudFormation has events, so when infrastructure is created, you can, you can create, create events. CloudFront, Kinesis, CodeCommit, they're all the main, the sort of the big, the, 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 the services which already implement into it. But then we also have Amazon CloudWatch event types, which give you even more stuff. So you can have like, on a code build, execute a Lambda, or, um, there's events inside of ECS or EC2 um, or Systems Manager and all sorts of different things that happen in your infrastructure can invoke these functions to kick off uh, stuff to happen and um, you can create interesting kind of applications. So um, we can even just have like a schedule for one of these things. So we can have an Amazon CloudWatch event which is scheduled like on a cron job, so we can say like uh, every minute, every five minutes, run this piece of Lambda and do some stuff with it. So this is an example. Uh, written by Norm uh, uh, on, the, on the .NET team. And um, what this one does, what this, this, this PowerShell Lambda does, is it's run, or you can run it on a schedule, and it just looks um, at all the ECT hosts, uh, all the, sorry, all the security groups in your AWS account, and it sees security groups in AWS uh, are basically the kind of like firewall description, so it tells you what the firewalls are open. So you have, might have a fleet of EC2 instances, and you have a security group attached to all these EC2 instances. If you open ports on the security group, um, if you open ports on the security group, then those ports will be open for all the EC2 instances which use that security group. So if we say um, this function, what it does, is it looks at all of the security groups, and it says, 
is port 3389 or RDP open on any of those uh, groups? And if it is, it revokes that ingress, so it stops that, um, that, that port being open. So basically, this is a, a lambda which is monitoring your, your infrastructure for someone which has changed some ports and fixing it. And we might run this every minute, every five minutes, every week, I don't know. So um, I actually do have this one. Uh, let's have a look. So over here, uh, demo, uh, demo for RDP. So you saw that the code there basically, oh, no, you can't see that, can you? <laughs> Why is it doing that then? Yeah, I try to get out of it though. Yeah. Why is it not mirroring? <sighs> Command F1. I've remembered. I remember the key cut. It wouldn't work on the on on the screen. You can see me frantically working on that, trying to. I should yeah. Well, you know. Is it command F1 does that, does switch it to mirroring? So thank God that I just remembered that randomly. Um, so, uh, what was that? Where was I? Oh, so, yeah, there's this function, uh, demo for RDP. Uh, demo for RDP. And I've actually already set this up. It's got a CloudWatch event on it. If I click on that CloudWatch event, this, by the way, is the console for a Lambda. Um, here you can see the, um, all of the different, uh, the, the, you can see the event or the information about that event. If I click away from that and just click on oh, on the Lambda itself, there's also information about you can choose how much memory a Lambda has here. You can see the timeout for a Lambda. Um, you can see uh, how debug and error handling is done, compliance, or, and, and so forth. If it's in a VPC or outside of a VPC, the execution role that it's running in. I'm using the demo Lambda IAM execution role. I use that for all of my... Uh, my Lambda demos that I do. And these execution roles basically are listed here, effectively. So these are, you, you create them in this IAM role, and then basically this says this Lambda is able to call these services. Um, the important one for this one is that it's able to call recognition. So that's, that's described in what this IAM role is, and that's what an IAM role is. Um, anyway, so we've got this uh, CloudWatch event, uh, which is here. If I click on that, you'll see that... Uh, um, I've got a schedule check which is created, and basically it's an expression of rate every rate one minute. And so, what should happen if I go to a security group over here and edit the inbound ports? Oops. If I go over here and edit the inbound ports and add. RDP and save. Oh, I need to. Anyone can RDP into my uh, security group. So I've added that over 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 there. And what's happening is um, this CloudWatch event, which is one of the many different triggers. Like you can see, all of the basic triggers here. You've got Kinesis, DynamoDB, Code Commit, CloudWatch, all those different things, which you could just drag over here and make uh, invocations or, so, to invocate your. Invoke, sorry, invocate, that's a new word. Invoke your, uh, your function. Um, so what should happen, if I go to the monitoring of this, I can see the invocations. You see that it's been running quite consistently every minute for a long time. And if I go to view cloud watch logs, and you see that there is, uh, is that? Most recent log. You can see it does like this scan here. Maybe you can't see. It's a bit. Uh... Oh, I can't zoom in. Sorry. Um, it says information. Sorry, I'll read it to you. It says scan complete and removed uh, zero EC2 security groups ingress rules. So if I just do a search there on these logs for re removed uh, zero, that will show me all the invocations where. There was zero, and if I do one, 
So one minute ago, this is UTC. Five more, oh yeah. One minute ago, this was executed, and it said, scan complete and remove one EC2 security group ingress rule. So hopefully, if I go back to my security group and refresh, you'll see that I no longer have any ports open on that security group because that, that function executed every minute, uh, and it's constantly moving every minute. I'll just quickly show you um, how you would set one of those things up. Uh, so if I go back to that demo function, demo RDP, and just delete that. Oh, I always get a bit confused. It says pending deletion. I didn't expect you to press save. And I always wait, wait just wait there. Just go, oh, keep, yeah. But it's really quite annoying. Um, and then we just put in CloudWatch events. Configuration required. Uh, rule. Create a new rule. Check on schedule. Just check on schedule. Um, and then a scheduling expression. Um, you can do, so I think, I think it's rate. You can put a cron expression in there, or they've got this, this sort of like natty thing, which is, um, why can't I zoom? Oh, there we go. This natty thing, which it says rate one minute. Um, and then if I apply that and add that, and then save, then that's that. Re, that's what working again, and it's going to be doing it every every minute again. And I could change that for rate every five minutes, every one hour, um, or put a cron job in there to kind of do it that way. So, where am I? Play from current slide. Um, a really another good way of of of, of invent inventing these uh, is using the Amazon Simple Queue service. If you have a lots of messages which are coming in, you can add them to these queues. And the um, Lambda function can pick them out of the queue. And they, there's a whole workflow for um, failed jobs, putting them back in the queue. And if they're failed multiple times, putting them into a, a dead letter queue um, so they won't be processed again. And as you build bigger and bigger applications, the important thing to remember with serverless is that things will not work. Things will go wrong. Um, you're dealing with many, many millions of executions. You, you have to think of a world where things will happen which are unexpected, uh, inputs will happen which you weren't expecting, users will put in stuff that you weren't expecting, and, and things will fail. Um, what's good about uh, working with serverless is that by dealing with queues and dead letter queues, you can actually start to see, well, what invocations actually did fail, and how can we reprocess them in, in the future, and how can we be, be more resilient? And it's very easy to start building architectures which are much more resilient using these simple queues. We also have a concept called Amazon Step Functions. Um, I won't demo this, but it, it basically allow, it allows you to orchestrate numbers of functions. So you can have functions which, which basically chain together uh, into an orchestration. And um, we call it step functions so that you can execute more complicated uh, orchestrations. Yeah, sorry. Um, so far we've seen oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, um, do they, do they, yes, so all of the different lambdas independently get triggered. But they're being triggered by this orchestration thing, which is the, the step function. Uh, you can call another lambda from a lambda, but that wouldn't be the best way of doing it. The best way would be to use an in intermediary queue. So you'd have a queue which you'd post link message into it, and then other other queues listening to that, or a topic which other things are listening to. But you can, but you shouldn't probably. Um, I've shown API gateway, a uh, very common way to execute a, a lambda function. Um, so what have we learned before? We, we've looked at uh, uh, PowerShell and Lambda. It's just PowerShell running in AWS at huge scale, really low cost, like what's not to love. Um, serverless allows you to forget about some of the infrastructure complexities and just focus on building highly scalable, highly available uh, code. So you can focus on your customer and the thing that you're good at individually. Um, and uh, it's event-driven computing, so you're only paying for the execution and computation that you actually use, um, and we pay, we charge per 100 millisecond increments. You know, um, it's not even per second billing anymore. Um, so that's everything. Um, if you want, if you want to know more, then um, go to GitHub.com forward slash AWS forward slash AWS dash Lambda dash dot net, and then in there, there's a folder called PowerShell, which basically has the command, the, the module for the PowerShell module. I'm uh, Martin Beebe. Um, 
uh, from AWS. There's my Twitter handle. It's at the Beebs. If you've loved this session, if you've really liked this session, if you think it's great, then please do uh, tweet me at the Beebs. If you hate this session, if you thought I was rubbish, if you thought I was uh, a waste of your time, then please just come and talk to me afterwards. Thank you. <laughs> Cheers. Thank you very much. <laughs>